Today, please welcome on stage Bebop Gresta of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. Hi. Uh, you're not sleeping anymore, right? Okay, good, good. So, um, I'm super happy to be here and to talk about my passion, uh, my baby, this company born um, very, very early, uh, immediately after Elon Musk published the white paper. And right now we are in the verge to build the biggest infrastructure that humanity has seen. But let me do a, a little uh, step back. Um, first, I, I was starting to do something, uh, a presentation, but then I thought it was better to try to do a social experiment. Let's try to answer all your questions even before you have it. So at the end, I will not be bombarded by these questions. Why do we need a new way of transportation? Right? There's a lot of people that says, you know, we already have trains, car cars, uh, boats, uh, and airplanes. Why right? to build a new one? Well, it's not properly all uh, shiny uh, out there. Uh, if you are complaining about the traffic in uh, Norway, it means only one thing. You've never been in India. You've never been <laughs> in China, right? They're ninja traffic jammer. They know how to do this thing. They have been stuck in traffic for 11 days. The port has been shut down for 16 hours. We can't do that. It's, it's really pro. And this is Beijing in a good day, because Beijing in a bad day looks like that. I've been there. <laughs> Just run over it. I know, it's, but airports, OK? We want to talk about that? OK, everything seems to know where we are going except our luggage. And we are stuck there looking to the carousel while they are delivering somewhere in Botswana. But th the thing is, is that it seems like plan to be broken from the beginning. I mean, there are shops now that resell your luggages for 70% of discount. So it's a bargain, you should go 11 shops open in America. It means we don't want to change. It's a system that actually works like that. Now, let's say I live in Oslo, OK? Uh, I'm 29, kind of, uh, profess uh, professional world changer, and I'm really, really humble, OK? And I'm searching for a girlfriend that maybe, OK, she's pretty, pretty and so on, but she lives in Lillehammer. OK? I'm not going to date her. <laughs> it's not going to happen. We are choosing who to love based on traffic. <laughs> but if I would tell you, tomorrow is the last day of your life, you would be pissed. You would be disappointed. You start to think, you know, oh my god, all the things that I haven't been able to do, my family and so on, it would be terrible. Well, if you live in one of these cities, you live in one, two, maybe three years less than was expected. And we think it's normal. We think it's, you know, yeah, uh, we're becoming numb, okay? This is not normal. They're stealing our life. 10 minutes here, half an hour there, one hour there. And we need to change this because it's impacting everything. Now, uh, Olnubru, okay, it's a jewel. We know it. It's an it's example of technologies, right? It's connecting the entire Norway uh, cities, and it's amazing. Well, it's amazing, but it's very vulnerable. I mean, if this gets stuck, we are, right? We can't do anything else. So it's, we are building our infrastructure, thinking that uh, you know, we apply the latest technology, but we really didn't think it through. And you know, we are depending on these things. They already reached the limit. We can't speed up more. Above 450 kilometers per hour, the air becomes liquid. And it, you are hitting a wall of water, basically. So it's, it's inefficient because it costs too much to maintain, to sustain. And it's not, you know, they're, they're, you know that uh, rails now is going back to tracks because, you know, especially in this region, it's not reliable. And you're big and bigger ships, but we haven't thought through on how to solve other problems. Like, for example, some companies are using our port as their secondary stock, and their taxpayers are paying for it. And it's extremely inefficient. Now, we think there's a solution. Now, the second question, what the hell is the Hyperloop, right? 
everybody is talking about it, but a lot of people doesn't know, right? Who, who of you doesn't know what the hyperloop is? Please, we are among friends. I, I'm not getting offended. One, two, three, four, okay. Please, security, remove these bastards from. <laughs> <laughs> I have a video, let me show you. I have a name for it, name for it which is called the Hyperloop. So what's Hyperloop? Mr. Musk's plan? Move people using a massive vacuum tube combined with a magnetic levitation system. Kind of like a Jetsons tunnel. It's something like that, yeah. Imagine a capsule filled with people. You put this capsule inside the tube. You create a low pressure environment inside the tube. So you have no resistance. And it's moving very fast from point A to point B. So the capsule, very similar to an airplane that goes in high altitudes, uh, can travel really fast with very little energy. Is the main trick to it uh, the vacuum and the fact that there's no friction? Is that the, the main reason yeah. why it makes it so fast? Tesla founder Elon Musk proposed this new technology called Hyperloop, and it's being developed right now in Playa Vista here in this hangar behind me. So when Elon published the document, he just drafted a possible way to achieve this. Two months later, uh, my business partner, Dirk Alborn, a genius German entrepreneur, uh, took this document, published in our website, the Jumpstart Found, and did a call to action. There was a great project, a great idea, and Elon actually said he wanted someone else to take it on. He wanted the community to make this happen. It's the first company that used crowdsourcing to solve one of the biggest problems of humanity, that is transportation. They have to work at least 10 hours a week, and we give them in exchange one stock for every hour worked. And we have been like overwhelmed of requests from engineers from all over the planet. Mm -hmm. you know, there were people from you know NASA, Tesla, SpaceX, uh, yeah. Boeing, MIT. We want to give the, uh, our community that's supporting us the possibility to own parts of, uh, of the company. So we are creating the biggest crowdsourcing project in the planet. Big headline of the day. Hyperloop's the Chief Operating Officer, Bipop Gresta. The transportation technology startup believes that the Hyperloop will be cheaper than high-speed rail in the country. Take a look. You have to consider that the Hyperloop is not a new idea. Uh, humanity tried to build this system several times in the past. India has a, a very big problem on infrastructure. The race is on. Elon Musk's vision for a high-speed passenger pods known as the Hyperloop is one step closer to becoming reality this morning. One of the known companies competing to capitalize on Musk's proposal announcing today it has struck a deal with landowners in Central California to build the first full-scale Hyperloop along a five-mile stretch along I-5. Uh, Dirk, tell me about this deal and, and really when you expect this Hyperloop, this five-mile stretch to be finished. We are able today to announce at the World Economic Forum the actual filing of the uh, construction permit mm. to the Kings County. From dream to reality, the Hyperloop, the vacuum tube trans transport company that wants to connect San Francisco and Los Angeles at 760 miles an hour could happen in as little as four years. Bebop Gresta is Hyperloop Transportation Technology COO and Deputy Chairman. He joins me out here today. Uh, it's good to see you, Bebop. And, and, Thank you, Kelly. And I'm learning a lot about the Hyperloop being out here. We announced uh, the start of the construction of the full-scale prototype in Cue Valley, north of Los Angeles. Can you imagine uh, and walk us through what it might be like to travel at the speed of sound? It's not going to be much different than uh, sitting in an airplane. Actually. In railroads, most accidents were all human factors. Plus, a lot of the derailments are actually happened because something's on the track. So we're in a closed system. We're completely managed by a computer system. Will the Hyperloop kill the railroad? The Hyperloop is going to do to the U.S. what the railroads did in the 1800s. So um, it will change the way we live. It's possible today. It's based on existing technologies and it's the right time. It's the right moment to finally get something doing like this. Is it visionary? In 30 years' time, will you and I be sitting on our rocking chairs going, well, we talked about it then, and he did it. Do you think this is possible? This is not just... Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Traveling by Hyperloop is going to be the future. They're, gonna, they're making this.
By the way, I'm the co-founder and the chairman. They always don't get it right. Anyway, so why hasn't it been before, right? So I have very few minutes, so I have to skip a lot of the, 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 the explanations. But imagine that this system started in 1869. And through the years, a lot of entrepreneurs tried to build it. And there was always, always the same problem. Scientists were against. They, they said, you know, human cannot travel above the 100 kilometers per hour. There were explanation. Even if uh, Robert Goddard, the father of the rocket science, patented the solution in 1904, there was not enough. Even the, um, the Ministry of Transportation, John Volpe, in 1969, published uh, uh, four different tube travel um, systems. They were very similar to the Hyperloop, but it never catch up. Imagination, the movies always talked about traveling inside the tube. But when Elon Musk, in 2013, published the white paper, something magic happened. The world waked up and show, show that there was a real possibility. What we did is a little bit crazy. Um, we, we took the white paper, published in our website, and did a call to action. Whoever has solutions to actually help us build it up, this system, join the team, and in exchange, we'll give you stock options. And what happened after is magic. We have created the biggest crowdsourcing project in the planet. Aside of a normal company of 30 people, there are 860 people working from 42 countries. And there are people from NASA, SpaceX, Tesla, Boeing, Aerospace, Lockheed Martin, DHL, uh, the biggest uh, uh, companies in the world, 40 of them, actually joined our team to actually make this happen. And now it's incredible. What we are actually uh, creating, it's a system that started with a very simple concept. We don't have to reinvent everything from scratch. We have the technology to build it. The only real thing that you need, different from what has been done before, is how to levitate it. Because right now, we don't have a very efficient way, but we found it. Using magnets to move and elevate trains is not a new thing. But this method hasn't been efficient enough to make sense on a large scale. The primary reason? Simple. A vast amount of energy is required to power the system. 20 years ago, a team of engineers from Lawrence Livermore Labs began the work that would solve those problems. For more than two decades, they've researched a full-scale functioning prototype. And in that time, they discovered how to arrange magnets over an aluminum track in such a way that the track uses almost no power, making it much more efficient. At Hyperloop, we've picked up where they left off adapting that revolutionary system for commercial use. There are several ways in which our system, using passive magnetic levitation, is safer and more efficient than maglev technology currently in use. Let's start with efficiency. Regenerative braking during deceleration recovers much of the energy used for acceleration. Power stations are not required along our track, making our system more affordable to build than previous levitation systems. Let's talk about safety. Only when the pod slows and returns to a safe speed will it gently touch down on the track once again. A comfortable, natural occurrence with our magnetic levitation system. At a slow, comfortable speed, the capsule rises up from the track. This levitation remains steady and constant through the duration of the journey. We find the smartest technologies and look for ways to improve them. You'll find this approach repeated over and over within every aspect of HTT innovation. So we know how to levitate a capsule without using any electricity. So you just need a linear motor to move it uh, backward and, and forward, and you have a, 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 the magic uh, new system for the next generation, because it's completely renewable. Now we have an announcement um, a week ago, sorry, a month ago, about build, starting to build the first full-scale uh, capsule. I will skip it because we don't have time, but uh, the, the sum of it is that with Carbures, the tier two manufacturer of Boeing, we, uh, Airbus, we are actually building the first full-scale capsule of history. It's scalable. What does it mean? We can build up to seven tubes 
on the same pylon. We use the ultra high performance concrete that allows us to have 30,000 PSI of resistance and can be 3D printed. We can do 100 kilometers a year. This is a new way to, to build uh, um, infrastructure. We are looking on how not to repeat the same mistakes of the past uh, by building it on top of existing right away. And completely sustainable means also that the way we produce energy has to be different. Now, as much as concern the pressure is very easy. There are companies that does it since 70 years, uh, labeled our partner, Teach, that, uh, teach us how. But uh, imagine uh, if you have to put um, passengers and freight that can depart every 40 seconds. You have a system that is virtually capable of transmitting 24 million people a year and substitute the entire freight industry um, in with one system. And imagine to be able to substitute the ports. We don't need ports. You need platforms that are actually capable of download the cargo and ship it worldwide without any intermediary. And we are working on this with several governments. Now, the sustainability of the project is also defined on how you produce energy. And we use a combination of renewable energy by combining wind, solar, kinetic energy, regenerative braking. And in some climates where the solar panels are not efficient, we use geothermal. The combination can actually give you up to 30% more energy than we consume. So it's a giant power station that happened to transport freight and people. Imagine the cost per pound. And the energy balance also reflects on other aspects. For example, we can imagine a system that doesn't require a ticket. But safety for us was the most important thing. And it's like replicating the air industry by putting an airplane inside a tube, but without the risk of it. Because in case of emergency, you can open the valves in 15 seconds, the air back, and then you can evacuate the people through the emergency doors. So we studied a way to solve all the problems that we have right now in several industries. Now, imagine what it is to be shot inside a tube. You will die, right? At the speed of sound. Well. I, I have to disappoint you. We already go at that speed. If you go to an A380, um, you actually go in at uh, um, a G, and we will be 0 0.8, because the G-force is a measure of acceleration. Now, I've had a nice video where my uh, team vindicated on me uh, to show you exactly what it is to, uh, to be inside a, 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 an hyperloop and go at 3G. And I was very disappointed, it's pretty boring. But let me skip this because I already uh, over... Uh, <laughs> so the uh, reality is that everything has to be redefined, including the passenger experience. And we invented a way to be better than reality. We can't have windows, but what we can have, it's a system that replicates reality. The, the, the screens are so defined that above 11K, you cannot distinguish if it's a windows or if a, a, a screen. Now, when you are able to actually replicate perspective, the trick is done. Where do you want to go? You want to go to Paris? You want to see Norway at the time of the Viking? We can bring you there. So it's a new generation of travels that actually looks at monetization in a brand new way, without thinking about charging a ticket, but finding new ways. Now, when? is happening. Is it a futuristic thing that will never happen or in 50 years? Well, I am here to disappoint you because we are now in negotiation with $20 billion contracts of several countries. And uh, as you probably saw, we've been uh, closing deals with several nations. We have been California, uh, France, uh, Slovakia, Czech Republic. But what I'm particularly proud and what's happening uh, we have the best companies in the planet that are joining our partnership program. I invite you to actually apply or to send me a mail because we need partners, especially in the shipping industry. We are going to announce a big uh, partnership, but we are very open and we need your help. Now, Quay Valley, Bratislava, then Brno and Toulouse and Jakarta, but we just terminated last week, the 24th of May, 
the first uh, full-scale feasibility study, that is the biggest study that has ever been conducted by a government on a hyperloop. And we will be going to publish it uh, immediately after Ramadan with the support of His Highness Fala bin Zayed Al Nayyan, that is my partner, and I'm so honored to have him uh, in my company. So uh, the, the conclusion uh, is that the future is not coming uh, tomorrow. It's actually present, and we are building it. Thank you very much. Thank you.